we're going to talk about inside and outside the mesh. So super interested here. I'm going to be taking notes, Asanka. So just pay attention, everyone, and, and you're going to guide us through mesh architectures. Thank you, Christian. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is, uh, I can't remember the number of times I have been with this program. It's been for a while. And I would like to thank Baptize and then um, Mehedi and other uh, the program committee for inviting me again. Uh, so um, as uh, Christian mentioned, I'm Asanka Basinga, Chief Technology Evangelist at WSO2. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, while telling the WSO2 story, I am providing strategic consulting for uh, various organizations. So that's my role uh, at WSO2. Uh, so as to the topic today, what I thought uh, during next 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, uh, spend on uh, the how the connection between the APIs and mesh architecture, um, and as well as where we should be in uh, when it comes to um, uh, defining the architecture as well as implementation, whether it's inside the mesh, outside the mesh, because these are very important when it comes to uh, uh, delivering digital um, uh, solutions as well as uh, architecting and implementing inside enterprises. So it's not like just uh, creating uh, an application inside a lab environment. What most of us are dealing is um, inside the uh, enterprises, uh, building these uh, uh, digital experiences through many digital channels. So my first interaction to uh, uh, mesh architecture happened uh, in an interesting way. One of my colleagues uh, called Prabhat Sirivardhana, who invited me to participate uh, in a panel with a couple of other folks who was uh, actively working on um, uh, mesh architecture at that time. This is uh, way back in 2017. Uh, so... Um, uh, so I was a panelist and then uh, the technology was new to me, but we were doing some research at that point. And interestingly, uh, the host or the person who moderated the panel was uh, Zamak, who invented data mesh after some time. I'll, I'll uh, speak about it in a different slide. Uh, so uh, this was my first um, experience with uh, the mesh architecture and specifically the service mesh related technologies. And you can see other panelists who are kind of uh, pioneers in the mesh technology. So my first uh, reaction to mesh was like this, whether we are going back to UDDI and WS Discovery, if, we are, if you are coming from uh, service-oriented architecture, SOAP and XML world, you might can remember these two technologies, uh, which came as a hype but failed uh, because um, the enterprises were, were enterprises were not ready uh, to utilize this type of open communication and unstructured communication inside the enterprises so it didn't work at all and then again i was thinking about the uh, microservice landscape published by uber uh, at the same time frame uh, but then again i didn't find a clear differentiation between that uh, that star diagram as well as some of the concept um, came with the service mesh and the uh, general mesh architecture but i was wrong they are the when i dig in deep into the mesh architecture i found uh, the the this is a path to find a solution for this uh, dead star uh, type of situations most of the microservice implementations were uh, at uh, that time so the fundamentals were really interesting inside the mesh architecture and my analogy for that uh, coming from a train and a railway system basically so if you look at there are three fundamental concepts but most of the time uh, some uh, two concepts are merged together the data plane sorry the control plane and the management plane uh, but i'll go through all three and then um, come back to that uh, later so basically the first part is about the control plane that is uh, providing the signals of the network and then make decision about how the traffic controls uh, inside the network so in the in my analogy the the trails or the you know, train uh, trails are the 
control plane uh, to take the train uh, to different destinations. And the data plane is where actually the data moves in the analogy, it's basically the train compartments that carries the passengers and good. So it's basically forwarding traffic between hops as well as take taking the data packets inside the network. Then there's this concept called a management plane, uh, that configuration, observability, monitoring, those type of uh, governance related capabilities are uh, uh, reside inside the management plane. But in most of the implementation, what uh, that we see today, the management plane and the control plane merge together. So uh, that's what um, uh, we see it as a two level or two plane architecture in most of the implementations that you have a control plane, uh, which includes the management plane capabilities, and then you have the data plane. So that's the fundamental concept. And a lot of people ask me what's the difference between a net and a mesh because uh, they get confused because net is basically a, a static structure, but uh, a mesh is different. It's basically based on nodes that you bring more and more nodes then the connectivity will get stronger and then the network will get um, distributed across uh, different uh, uh, locations based on the number of nodes that connected to the network so that's the main difference in between a net and a mesh and uh, that's how mesh is more dynamic as well as uh, can have better uh, control over the network uh, compared to a static uh, net architecture then there are many styles introduced uh, as uh, mesh architecture styles. Most popular and common uh, usage pattern is the service mesh, that how you can connect a uh, number of uh, microservices running inside enterprises. And with the service mesh, this concept of a sidecar came into the picture uh, to um, have a, a decoupling of the business logic versus the communication layer because in the distributed architectures we can't uh, use middleware like we used in the earlier uh, ages uh, though currently it's basically uh, the middleware either it's uh, inside the code or inside the network so that's where the patterns like uh, a sidecar came into the picture but the problem with sidecar architecture, one car is okay, but uh, what uh, we have seen uh, when it comes to observability, when it comes to communication, when it comes to various other capabilities required inside the logic, uh, the same style we used in the early architectures like shared libraries, uh, people tend to add many sidecars to the business logic. As a result, sometimes you will find many sidecars um, around the business logic. So that's a problem. The lightweight nature that we required in, a, in the modern architecture will not provide it if you add many sidecars to the uh, main logic or the service running inside the uh, your network. So that's one problem that we see. So there are uh, another style. So data mesh is another style. Now you have the main communication coming through the, the, the service mesh. Uh, but then again, data is really important. Uh, so how you can have a distributed data architecture is what uh, the data mesh is explaining. And um, uh, it's getting very popular as well as a bunch of uh, persistency related issues we had in the microservice architecture solved by the data mesh architecture and one of my favorites especially when i'm providing consultancy work especially the architecture consultancy work for many organizations so kudos uh, on uh, this uh, particular pattern that uh, uh, helping us to improve the uh, mesh architecture as well as uh, uh, smooth microservice implementations. And the event mesh is getting popular as well. Uh, so it's basically changing the protocols as well as uh, identifying new ways of how you communicate in between uh, the uh, uh, different service logics. It's basically using publish and subscribe and using uh, the eventing and streaming protocols to communicate in between different hopes so not big difference between the service mesh but uh, taking service mesh into next level with the uh, event driven architecture principles as well as uh, implementations of different type of service brokers.
So then the identity mesh is another concept coming. Uh, even I was speaking about this uh, in a, a different conference about the concept of a digital double and how you have digital identities inside the uh, uh, your digital ecosystem and how you connect these different identities using identity mesh. And some um, organizations are calling it as a identity fabric. Uh, so this is a very important concept when it comes to uh, Web3.0 and more distributed um, architecture styles that uh, most of the organizations are looking forward for. So those are few styles and there can be many other sub patterns, but these are the uh, most popular stuff. So those are the uh, what, uh, how the uh, the mesh architecture came into the picture, and then what type of implementations that we can find in the market, and how uh, these things are helping. Uh, so I would like to change the topic a little bit, and then get into the enterprise because anyway uh, we have to implement these uh, uh, concepts inside the um, enterprise. So before that, uh, I would like to bring this uh, uh, Conway's law. So what Conway said: organization will design system by in their communication and structure. Uh, so the, the main change happened inside the organizations. Organizations are also moving from a centralized architecture into a decentralized architecture. That's what uh, we see in, uh, especially with the digital native companies. So basically modern organizations are modular and they are divided or separated based on different functions. And when it comes to technical terms, we call these uh, different type of uh, functions as domains or subdomains. As an example, in a typical organization, accounts can be one domain, HR can be another domain, and sales, uh, so and so forth. There can be different functions related to uh, specifically uh, labeled as different domains. And it's totally depending on, uh, it's depending on how uh, you are structured the organization as well as what type of capabilities exposing through the uh, these uh, different type of functions uh, to their internal groups as well as external groups and uh, uh, and it can label in based on the organization uh, operational structure and then the organizations um, uh, are modular so that way they are consuming different type of systems based on these domains. So each and every domain will have their own system of record layers, as well as um, a different type of uh, application structures based on the capabilities that they require to um, help, uh, help to operate as well as increase the productivity. Then they will uh, start connecting these uh, different system. That's where the digitization coming into the picture and different domains will start connecting uh, these systems and data. Then the digital transformation activities will come and they will start building digital experiences on top of these connectivities that they made. So we are going back to the Conway's law. Now the communication structure is not exactly what we saw inside the uh, mesh architecture. It's not a common mesh that we see inside the enterprise. These are separated by domains. So now if we are looking at the communication structure required to adjust to the organization structure, then we need a change. And how we can change that is a question. So I had the same question as well. As a result, what I did basically uh, look at the fundamental way of how uh, these organizations are uh, designing the system. So domain-driven design is a common pattern and most of the organizations using domain-driven design to uh, bring those uh, organization architecture principles into the systems that they develop. As a result, um, in 2018, I introduced this concept called a cell-based architecture, basically to address this problem on how we can facilitate these different domains, facilitate uh, the autonomous teams, and have some architecture principle across the enterprise which we can utilize or leverage to uh, create a common communication style. So in this particular uh, pattern, uh, a cell is an architecture construct that can um, self-contain and uh, independently deployable. And this is completely API-centric. Uh, so that's how 
this is this. I'm not going in detail. I have put the URL uh, in the bottom of the slide. Uh, so if you are interested, you can go and uh, read this uh, paper and it is released under Creative Commons. So if you have any suggestions, you can contribute as well. So the, in this architecture, the, the mesh concepts are heavily utilized and inside the cell, uh, it's basically we call it as a local mesh. Uh, the components or microservices and other relevant components inside the cell will communicate using a local mesh and there's a global mesh that how these uh, cells will get connected to provide enterprise level capabilities. So there's a local mesh and there's a global mesh outside the um, uh, or common to all the cells running inside the enterprise. And if you look at it in a very enterprise architecture view, uh, it looks like this, this is a hypothetical scenario, uh, but um, uh, there are a number of cells and those are exposing APIs and the communication inside the cell will happen through a different type of mesh technologies and uh, on top of that you build your application layer so this is an example of how it will uh, looks like so in summary a uh, couple of things uh, we need to look at one uh, a lot of people think these are two technologies service mesh or the mesh architecture and um, the apis are uh, kind of competing technologies but these are not competing technology these are supporting technologies uh, contributing to each other to have a, a better composable enterprise and the combination of these uh, technologies you can streamline the communication inside the organization because uh, you need to provide autonomy to each and every uh, two pizza teams or autonomous teams but you need some governance on top of that to have um, uh, to apply policies uh, bring security standards uh, so and so forth and another thing happening uh, that we should not forget apis are the products of 25 uh, 21st century uh, because um, the apis are the key it creates an composable enterprise and top of that you can build any digital uh, experiences. So uh, the API uh, should treat as product inside the organizations. Uh, to do that, you need to have a proper supply chain. And I have spoken about this topic many times, even at um, uh, this conference, uh, I think last year and a year before. So you should have a proper supply chain. Not only that, if APIs are treating as a product, then it should have a full API lifecycle management as well. And the mesh architecture is improving. So you will see service measures, data measures, event and identity measures, and it will increase with the changes we see in the architecture side as well as implementation of many digital solutions. And we see that um, more and more uh, mesh architecture support is embedded into the languages. So you don't need this uh, uh, sidecar type of uh, uh, architecture style. So uh, once it's embedded into the language, as well as infrastructure, uh, technologies like Kubernetes are supporting well. Uh, so you can easily implement these uh, technologies inside your organization. And then we see there are movements happening in the technology side as well. So one example is eBPF, that how you can uh, increase the um, uh, increase uh, the communication and then get more and more um, uh, performance inside this communication by going with low level protocols like eBPF is happening. So it is becoming mainstream as well as trying to address problems that we see in the mesh architecture. And the future is about uh, more and more distributed styles. So Web 3.0 becoming a reality and metaverse all uh, almost, I think, uh, uh, coming to the business side as well. It's a very popular uh, style in the uh, gaming and social, but uh, it is coming to other businesses as well. So these are highly distributed architectures and mesh will fuel a lot and APIs will bring um, governance and control on top of the mesh to build more uh, future-proof applications inside the enterprises. So as a technology provider, we are contributing to these uh, concepts as well. Um, and a couple of things, one, like it's really hard to build uh, 
production ready miss architecture so uh, we are providing few platforms that uh, has taken the burden of that uh, so we provide two platforms one called Corio that is mainly focusing on how you build digital applications using a api centric architecture uh, so that contains all these technologies embedded inside that you can just come and build applications without worrying about implementing that side and the ascardio is the uh, identity uh, solution that is uh, leading towards to a identity mesh and if you are interested of on building uh, these technologies inside your organization we provide a full api management capabilities to our api manager as well as if you want to secure these uh, uh, communications as well as uh, components you can use the identity server component and um, i'm not going in detail if you are interested we have a booth uh, in this uh, conference you can go there and then get more information or go to wso2.com and find more details so if you would like to continue this discussion, these are my uh, contact details. It's a broader uh, uh, topic, so it's really hard to discuss everything uh, during a 25 minute slot. Uh, so, and I would like to uh, continue this discussion as well. Uh, this is my um, blog, uh, url that i frequently blog there and then if you need help uh, we can provide some strategic consulting on these topics and this is my linkedin url and i'm really active on twitter so uh, you can uh, use either method and get connected and i'm happy to have a productive conversation with you uh, so uh, that's uh, all i have lined up uh, for today and uh, if there are any questions i'm happy to take it now um, or uh, if you would like to uh, have an offline conversation, feel free to contact me through uh, these uh, communication channels I shared. Christine, I think you are on mute. There we go. The old mute button. Um, really interesting. And thank you for that. I love your diagrams also. You can tell you have a design background. But a question came in around APIs and microservices, and you made a point that they can coexist and they work well together. Can you talk through a little bit of how that applies to um, API, or excuse me, architecture, simplification, um, systems thinking? How does that come together as an architect? How do you think about that? Yeah, so, so I think the fundamentals uh, have not changed. So the um, implementation is the service and the interface to communicate uh, is the API. So having that differentiation will help because uh, API, API specification or the structure of the API cannot change frequently uh, because uh, uh, when people start consuming mm. it, uh, it's a contract. But the innovation should happen. So innovation uh, will happen inside the service. So if you have this separation, then you can innovate uh, freely inside the services. That is how I see uh, these two concepts. And those are very supportive uh, technologies. And we need both technologies to um, uh, have a stable enterprise as well as uh, uh, increase the innovation inside our enterprises as well. OK, perfect. I really appreciate the succinct answer and you do have ways to get in touch we'll also publish this um and i noticed that wso2 has one of the booths in the treasure hunt yeah so if folks want to go over there and get that question answered on the treasure hunt um there's 500 dollars gift card on the line so again sanka thank you so much for this it was really fascinating and i appreciate it thank you very much thank you